Hello students, it's good to have you back today. We shall be discussing about attractions and entertainment as this is another aspect that is very, very important to the tourism industry. Having talked about um, food and beverages in the last um, class and of course, some other important aspects such as um, accommodation, it's very, very important also to make mention of attractions and entertainment as they account largely for reasons why people even um, travel in the first instance. Therefore, we shall be um, discussing about the major classifications of attractions and entertainment in the tourism industry. After we should try to understand the differences among heritage attractions, commercial attractions, and live entertainment. We're going to move further to identify the key marketing, management, and financial issues facing attractions and entertainment operations. After which, we'll try to discuss the um, major types of heritage attractions and further describe the major types of commercial attractions. And lastly, for today, we'll try to um, describe the major types of life entertainment. So these are basically the learning objectives at the end of the um, class. You should be able to highlight all these that have been mentioned. Now we want to talk about um, attractions and entertainment. Like we all know that um, most tourists are interested or they travel for leisure, they travel for uh, maybe vacation and so on and so forth. So it's very, very important that um, they move or they focus on areas where or places where they think they are attracted to. This is where they've heard of, they've read of, you know, maybe they've um, heard of or they've read about on the internet and so on. So, or even places of entertainment where they can um, be entertained, they might have had some information about some places where they can entertain, I mean, be entertained. So people have always traveled to experience this um, special attraction of distant places. You want to travel, you know, far and wide just because you want to have an experience of a particular place. Attractions and entertainment provide the opportunity to participate in a variety of leisure activities, all right? Feeling leisure time of tourists. When tourists travel, of course, they need to visit places. They need, I mean, they need to visit places. And then, and then, I mean, there and then they need to be entertained, all right? So these attractions and enter, uh, entertainment and places are where they get this kind of um, uh, opportunity to also participate in different variety of leisure activities. Natural attractions and festivals are traditionally popular, right? Among the populace, people do travel to natural attractions. These are already there. They are made by nature and they are already um, in given certain places. Festivals are also uh, um, side of attractions. You know, they are also, I mean, they are also meant to entertain people, all right? And they also, I mean, serve as attractions to people. Alternative also, um, uh, they are bound nowadays. We have a range, a wider range nowadays. We have theme parks, we have all other forms of uh, attractions and entertainment. So here is just um, a figure showing the entertainment activities enjoyed by um, North Americans. A world of opportunities. The menu of attractions and entertainment is almost limited when it comes to um, entertainment and um, uh, attractions, all right? When people are attracted to places, there are a wide range, okay, of opportunities that are bound. They get there, they get entertained, they get there. They, you know, they feel engaged. They, they, I mean, the, the opportunities are limitless. The, the attractions that they get are limitless. There are different places that people can go uh, worldwide, globally, all right, whether it's the Americas, whether it's Africa, whether it's um, Europe, and so on and so forth. So people can go far and wide just to get uh, entertained or to get this award of opportunities of seeing some places of attractions, all right? So there are three broad categories that are used when it comes to um, attractions, all right? We have the heritage attraction, we have the commercial attractions, as well as the live entertainment. So we're going to take this um, three um, one after the other. So heritage attractions, <laughs> we all know what heritage are, all right? So they are basically meant to preserve nature, to preserve, um, you know, uh, their historical sites, so to say. And then we have the commercial um, attractions, which are majorly um, um, combination of amusement park and theme, theme parks, gaming, shopping um, centers or mall as you, as you may call it. Then we also have the live 
entertainment, which could be in the form of um, sporting activities, performing arts, fairs, festivals, and events. So all these are the um, attractions and entertainment um, sample. When it comes to heritage attractions, like I mentioned earlier, you want to have um, um, historical sites that have been preserved, all right? Historical, historical site. We also have the likes of zoos, of course, and aquariums or aquaria. We have um, um, parks and preserves, okay? You have um, some natural parks and preserves. So there are so many other types of um, heritage um, attractions apart from museum and uh, historical and uh, other historical sites. We have different historical sites um, globally that one can um, explore if you want to travel. Then we have amusement and theme parks, which are part of um, commercial, which are types of commercial attractions, right? We have amusement park. Then we have the gaming. Uh, I mean, gaming also is uh, one of the uh, commercial attractions where people can travel for gaming purposes, right? We're still going to talk more about that. And then for shopping experiences too, people do travel, tourists do travel for shopping experiences, especially to certain sites where they know that that is the only place where they can get um, any particular item, for instance. Then we have the live entertainment, which comprises of sporting activities. All right, we're still going to talk about that in detail, whether it's just for, um, whether it is for participation or for um, maybe just watching and so on and so forth. Then we have performing arts too, as well as um, fairs, festivals and events. Now we're going to talk about the foundations of understanding attractions and entertainment, right? Attraction and entertainment are similar in quite a number of ways. The first similarity is that both of them, I mean, for both of them, the travelers, it's the choices of the travelers about how to use their leisure time, whether it's for attraction or entertainment or something, it's the choices of travelers or tourists on how to use their leisure time. Both are planned around natural locations, whether it is um, um, attraction sites, historical sites or commercial or even um, events, life events. They are planned around natural locations and historical sites, especially for um, attractions or activities and they have themes, they have events, events are also, I mean events, some events are also planned around some particular period of time or seasons, for example, maybe it's Christmas or maybe it's um, maybe Edge season, some things will be planned towards that um, particular event so that um, tourists can um, be attracted to visit um, those um, places. Both may be operated on the not-for-profit, right, or for a profit and basis. It depends on um, the goal or the objectives of um, those that are or the organizers, whether the owners or the proprietors or the organizers. So it could be just for um, non-profit or um, for profit and business. The differences between them is that one, attractions are situated around natural locations. You're going to find objects in them. They are constructed and um, facilities that have special appeal to both tourists and um, visitors. For attractions, they already have natural locations. You want to talk about maybe waterfall, you want to talk about some streams, you want to talk about some kind of rivers, different um, site attractions, I mean, attractions that you can think of. At times, there could be objects where you have objects that are placed or preserved in a um, museum or any heritage or whatever, Islamic heritage library, some other things like that. Or there are times that they are constructed and facilities, they are constructed and facilities that have special appeal to both the tourists as well as the local visitors. While entertainment, on the other hand, they are usually temporary. They are usually temporary. While attraction is um, uh, fixed, sort of, they are located in particular places and they are fixed. Anytime you go there, you can visit the place at any time. But for entertainment, they are usually temporary and um, they surround around, I mean, they are fixed around particular events. For example, festival, I mean, festivals, fairs, all right, they are always um, temporary. So that's the basic um, uh, um, difference between the two, the key difference between attraction and entertainment. All attractions are influenced by seasonal changes, while entertainment can be, <coughs> excuse me, entertainment can be planned to take advantage of the seasonality. Entertainment can just be, I mean, planned just to take advantage of that particular season. And once the season is over, then the event is, um, I mean, it will wrap up. It will be wrapped up once the season is over. For example, maybe, like I make, make, made mention of uh, maybe the Christmas season, some events might be 
um, 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 you know, organized or arranged for that particular period, just to serve that, I mean, that purpose, just to welcome tourists to that particular area during that period. And once the period is over, then that's all. But for attractions, they are like um, fixed, okay? They are influenced by seasonal changes, while the other one only take advantage of the, I mean, while the, uh, what I mean by the other one is entertainment, all right? While entertainment only takes advantage of the seasonality. Now we are moving on to seasonality. Seasonality is often a major characteristic of demand for attractions. When there is a demand for attractions. When seasonality is severe, then attractions will only operate during that part of the year. When it is severe, I mean severe, that is when attractions will only operate. Managers try to increase attendance during the shoulder end of season. This is one of the challenges because once it is off season, then there are some costs, operational costs that the company or the uh, whatever you want to call it, organization might want to, or the industry now might want to, I mean, we still be incurring. You want to pay salary staff, you want to pay maintenance costs, you want to pay some other things. So this is going to really affect the business once it is not the season for, uh, I mean, the event or, uh, I mean, the event or it's not the season for people to visit or for tourists to come to those places. So this is the issue that managers need to contend with. They try to increase attendance during the shoulder as well as the off season. Recruiting, training and retraining employee is a special challenge for highly seasonal attractions. When attractions are highly seasonal, they, some may not, uh, I mean, find it easy to keep staff throughout the year. So you only want to employ them for that particular period where the, you, know, you need your service for that particular period to serve the purpose and once that is over, once the event is over, then that is all. Maybe till another season, till the next season, probably a year or, so, or maybe some months later. So for you to now recruit new staff, to train them again and to even retrain, if you, I mean, if they are still your previous staff, for you to even retrain them again is going to cost, uh, um, yeah, it's going to cost a lot, you know, and that is quite challenging for seasonal attractions, attractions that are tied to seasons. So once it's not, I mean, once it's not the season, then there's nothing the staff will be doing. And once they are not doing anything, it's, it's likely that they lose touch with the skills that they need or they require to satisfy tourists effectively. So um, what um, recruiters or managers do is to recruit again, to train and to retrain those that have been there before. And this is a kind of um, challenge for seasonal attractions. Cash flow needs to be carefully planned, right? So as to have funds when operating expenses are incurred. Like I mentioned um, earlier, that you need to carefully plan or you, you need to like continue incurring some expenses so as just to remain in business. Whether it is the season or not, you need to still incur those expenses. For example, maybe maintenance costs. If it's a side attraction, for, for instance, now, or even if it's a life event, if it's a side, uh, side attractions, whether or not people are, I mean, tourists are flopping in, you still have to maintain the place to keep it neat, to, I mean, to keep it clean and so on and so forth. Even your staff, you have some staff that um, must work. For example, maybe the security and some other staff, all right? You still have to continue um, incurring these um, operating expenses, regardless whether it is um, on season or off season. Managers often add complementary activities to try to generate visitors, all right? For example, the mountain biking at the ski resort, all right? So you need to try as much as possible to add complementary um, activities to, uh, apart from the visitation to the side attractions, you need to add some complementary activities so as just to generate visitors, so as to attract more people to the sites for more tourists to come. If people come and they are satisfied, then they tell others to come as well. So you have to add um, complementary activities. Strategies for staffing and seasonality is also very, very important when it comes to um, attractions. All right, you have to know or strategize on how you want to um, get your staff or how you want to um, organize your staff. The number of staff that you want to maintain during the off season, the number of staff that you want to employ when the season is at time. Peak or when it is seasonal 
period. There are strategies for also, I mean, seasonal cash flow management. You need to, managers also need to be able to strategize on how to manage their cash flow when it comes to um, seasonality. Heritage attractions. Heritage attractions involve, um, like we mentioned earlier, that um, are places, natural places where you have um, maybe um, museum or historical sites or, and so on. You, have, you may have zoos and aquarium, you may have parks and preserve, you may have fairs as well as um, um, festivals. So all these are examples of um, heritage attractions. It's about the heritage, it's about history, They're about um, historical sites or facts. That is where they are kept for people to uh, visit and learn and know more about um, history. Commercial attractions involve um, amusement parks, like we mentioned earlier, that it could be for profits or for uh, non-profit um, making. We have amusement parks, okay, that which are parks with ride and other entertainment activities, like um, maybe the uh, um, water park and so on. So all these are commercial attractions. We also have um, theme parks. They are similar with amusement parks, but they have some unique um, characteristics. They have their own special unique um, characteristics. It's, <coughs> excuse me, theme parks create a destination for themselves. They have, they have a specific um, destination and they try to create it. It has a theme and then uh, uh, the destination will be the place where people will, will I mean, the side attraction, the attractions for the tourists to visit. For example, this um, Disneyland, which is the um, first time um, theme park. Apart from the Disneyland, now we have different parks all over the world, all right? There are so many um, different uh, parks all over the world, apart from the Disney. Although, this, although Disneyland was the first time um, theme park. So basically, theme parks are more or less like the amusement park, but they also have some other um, unique um, characteristics. Gaming. Gaming, we all know what um, gaming is. It was legalized in Nevada in 1931 to attract tourists during the Depression. All right, during the Depression of 1931, some people um, went into gaming and um, it became something that um, so many people got involved with and it was eventually legalized, all right? Explosive growth in the um, United States, Macau, Singapore, and Canada during the past um, few years. It has actually um, experienced explosive growth especially in this um, new internet age, all right? So um, across these um, countries that have been mentioned and of course other countries globally, gaming has actually witnessed an uh, explosive growth across um, citizens. These are the five primary reasons for the increase in the growth of gaming. First is that voters approve because it says as a voluntary tax that increases um, government um, revenue. Apart from that, more people than ever before are choosing casino gaming as an ac uh, acceptable leisure activity. People has, have now accepted it as a leisure activity. So whether you are old or you are young or you are mid-age and so on, since it's being accepted now, people now go, all right, they now choose casino to go and play games and they see it as a means of um, entertaining themselves. I, I'm having, you know, their leisure time, spending their leisure time. It's popular among retirees whose numbers continue to grow. So many retired people are resorting to gaming as well. Marketing programs help attract previously um, ignored low roller. It was initially a low roller, but later on, marketing improved. And so many people also became aware of gaming and they are now, you know, involved. They are now involved in it. And lastly, um, the among the reasons for the increase in gaming is because of the expanded availability of gaming opportunities. There are so many casinos that you want to even, uh, you can get um, games and I mean <clears throat> for household use and so on and so forth. People can even travel for gaming purpose, whether to go and watch or to also participate and so on. So these are the reasons for the increase in gaming. What are the gaming alternatives that are available? There are four um, broad categories of um, gaming alternatives. We have the traditional full-scale casino gaming, 
all right for example we have at las vegas and atlanta city all right then we have the historic limited state operations these are i mean those in um, colorado's and mining towns then we have the dock side which is um a river boats or the dock side and casinos then lastly we have the native american reservations these are um, the gaming for broadband gaming activities, I mean, alternatives that are prevalent in the United States. So please take note. Native American reservation gaming operations, which vary from small to large scale. All right, so all these are the categories of um, um, gaming alternatives. We have the full um, scale casino, the full scale casino gaming, the limited stake operations, the dockside casino, as well as the Native American reserve, um, reservation gaming so here is a milestone in the gaming history and it's good how it has um, grown so far all right don't forget i mentioned earlier that um, it started or it was legalized in 1931 all right casino gaming was legalized in nevada in 1931 <coughs> and in 1969 it was legalized in canada in 1978 it was legalized in atlantic um, city and so on and so forth. In um, 1988, Indian Gaming Regulatory Act made gaming possible on tribal land in almost every state. So that is um, the milestone and so on and so forth until 2006, where the gaming revenue in Macau exceeded that of um, Las Vegas Strip. Now we are moving on to gaming segments. What are the segments of gaming? First, we have the eye rollers. These are sophisticated gamblers who often play internationally and focus on game of skill rather than luck. So what they focus on mostly is their skill. So they are eye rollers, they are sophisticated um, gamblers. The second category are the, uh, I mean, the second segment is the day trippers, right? They typically, they are typically retirees, like I mentioned earlier. They make short duration trips to operations within is in driving distance they can travel to um you know short distances and then they play slots and video gaming options so these are the segments of um gaming the eye rollers the um day trippers apart from eye rollers and day trippers we also have the low stake or the new adopters these are we have the baby boomers all right the generation um x who have recently accepted gaming as a leisure alternative and lastly we have the um, family vacationers right these are families who gamble as an offshoot to other family vacation activities provided at gaming venues shopping 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 we all like shopping shopping can be part of traveling or the reason for a trip at times it's just part of it maybe it's just um one of the reasons while you're traveling and at times it's even the main reason for a trip like i mentioned earlier that uh, there are some specific um, uh, um locations where some items are, are pertinent that some items are traced or they can only be found in those uh, particular uh, places so if you are traveling for the purpose of getting that particular kind of item then you are traveling or your trip is mainly for that um, for that shopping purpose so it could be one part and it could also be the main um, reason for traveling foreign travelers to us are very likely to shop during their visit that's it's seven percent according to research many malls are transforming themselves into tourists and attractions by adding i mean by adding rides and other entertainment attraction and that's very true you go to so many malls these days you find that uh, um attractions all right like the ride the ride is especially common in other entertainment um attractions we even have some maybe um live events where uh, musicians will be playing and so on um not necessarily reviews, um, musicians not necessarily musicians but maybe um some entertainers so to say will be having their own um show or something like that right there in the mall so they are form of um um let's say side attractions apart from um the shopping mall itself Live entertainment. <clears throat> For live entertainment, we have one sporting activities. We're talking about other types also. The original sporting activities or competition in Greece were organized as contests. And later on, um, the Romans expanded the idea and staged them as game for public entertainment. They became a game for public entertainment. Initially, they were just um, 
uh, contest, right? They were just competition that we organized, and later uh, we organized, I mean, by degrees. But later on, the Romans now expanded the idea and they now um, stage them for public um, entertainment. They are now staged as games for public entertainment. There are three types of um, sports tourism. The first category are, or the first type is those active um, sports tourism where participants travel to take part in the sports. Here we have um, maybe footballers, for example, tennis players, and so on and so. So many sports and activities where participants will have to travel to take part in such um, um, sports. We have event sport tourism where participants travel to watch a sport. Okay, they are traveling purposely to watch that um, particular sport. And the third type is the nostalgia sport tourism where participants visit sports related attractions such as. Halls of Fame, the famous stadia, a sports theme crisis. So these are the um, types of um, sports tourism. You are either traveling as a participant, all right, to go and take part, or you are traveling to watch a sport, or you visit um, sports attractions. The performing arts, we have the, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> my bad. The performing arts, we have the classical performing arts, which involves um, theater, ballet, opera, concert, and the symphony. So all these are examples of the classical um, performing arts. And nowadays we have also the contemporary performing arts, which involves the stand-up and um, improvisational comedy. We have rock concerts and even the band that is playing in your favorite local or sports. All these are categories of um, contemporary performing arts. So, so far, so good we've been able to um, complete our discussion for today. It's quite a short um, topic, but it's um, very interesting, you know. Just read more about it in your, in your book that has been attached to the portal. So, <clears throat> entertainment and attractions, we've talked about the um, historical, the, um, the commercial, as well as the live entertainment. On this note, we've come to the end of our discussion. Like I mentioned, thank you so much for your audience. Hope to see you again next week. Inshallah, we'll be moving on to another topic. Before then, please do take care of yourself and stay safe. Bye. Thank you.